House, um, it's the uh, meeting of House Agriculture and Forestry, and we are well, really um, lucky today to have with us the Senate Agriculture Committee as we try and finalize some of the language around the um, dairy assistance program, the non-dairy assistance program, and the uh, adding some language regarding farmers markets. So um, thank you uh, senators for, for joining us. I don't know if you've got to be on the floor at some point, but um, Bobby, is there anything you would like to say? Well, just that, uh, you know, we're anxious to, um, to get this language done and so we can move it on to the appropriate uh, people and, and try to get it uh, into law as soon as uh, possible. Uh, I think Michael and your committee and, and Steve at the agency um, has been working on some short revisions. And so it'd be good to you know, go over those revisions and see uh, uh, if our committee can can run with it. Yeah, we we got that. I uh, I think it came um, later last night. I didn't get it until uh, just a little bit uh, a little while ago, but uh, took a look at it. Various members of our committee did look at it and thought that it accomplished the goals. Um, but why don't we? Uh, put that up. We're lucky today to have Michael Grady and also members uh, from the A Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets with us. And uh, Linda, can you go ahead and try and put that language up? Thank you. And Mike, would you be willing to go through it with us? Sure. Thank you. Um, I couldn't find the right of way. Uh about the farm trackers and implements of husbandry. It's, I've, I've found it before, but I'm gonna just email Anthea right now. Um, okay, great. There, there was a question before we started um, from Terry Norris about who has the right of way in terms of large farm equipment versus um, uh, regular passenger vehicles. So thanks Mike for doing that. Okay. Um, so yesterday you reviewed the proposed changes to Act 138 to address some of the issues that have arisen with the um, coronavirus relief funds that you appropriated to the agency. Uh, page one, two, and three, there are no changes. Similarly, page four and five, there are no changes. On page six, um, May is highlighted at the top of the page because you had a I posed a question to you yesterday of it should be May or shall, and you said you wanted it to be May. So it's May. Um, yeah. And then on page seven, line 14, uh, this was the um, revision that I recommended and that Senator Hardy requested that uh, notwithstands the requirement in Act 138 section 7 d5 uh, related to the net profit requirement for those persons applying to the non-dairy program there is a typo there on line 14 if there's it should say it is the intent not tt um, and then moving on to page eight there was the request yesterday i believe it was specifically from senator pearson that there be language included about the uh, application of the W-2 slash sole proprietor requirement, the W-2 requirement for sole proprietors. So it is the intent of the General Assembly that a sole proprietor that applies for coronavirus relief fund assistance from the Agency of Agriculture shall not be disqualified from receiving an award because of inability to provide a W-2 form, form to the agency. So sole proprietors are really the only ones that are having the issue because those that aren't sole proprietors have W-2s. Um, and it's, it's not that they uh, haven't submitted one, it's that they, they have the inability to provide that W-2 form because they did not register under a W-2 form. Um, so I think this language works, but I'm willing to discuss if you would like. 
Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, it, uh, has the agency looked at that, uh, Michael? And uh, no, I haven't. I haven't sent it to the agency yet. I was trying to get some feedback. I I thought the House was meeting first and then the Senate, so I was trying to get the House feedback before I gave it to you. But um, uh, so that's what I was trying to do, I, and I haven't sent it to the agency. Well, uh, Steve is on on with us this morning. Uh, Steve. Uh, what do you uh, do you think that language will work for you guys? Uh, can you hear me, Senator? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Senator <laughs> Starr. I just looking at this now, as Mike said, and I think it's fine. I'm not sure about the inability to provide a W two. It might because that suggests it might be more of an administrative issue that they that they have a w-2 but can't provide it so it might be better to just say does not use a w-2 or something like that but it, that's not a minor detail yeah I, I i i had submit but submit means that they might have one i had um apply with uh, i it's it's i think that language could be played with a little bit and i'm more than willing to talk about it i see chris's hand is up yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Michael, the um, this really comes into play with the working lands, and that, as I understood it, actually comes through ACCD. And so I'm wondering if if you think that's a problem here because it just references the the ag agency. Um. Well, remember that you're giving the agency well first let me back up the working lands money was appropriated under act 137 which was referred to as the accd bill but it is appropriated to working lands which is an agency of agriculture program um plus so plus, plus our money if we uh, let the agency move money around, that was all appropriated to the ag agency. And if it ends up in working lands. Well, that's what I was going to say. The second point is you've given the agency the ability to pool these funds into or reallocate. So it's really the agency of agriculture that the one and the, the applications are going to the agency of ag agriculture. They're really the one that, that should not apply the W-2 requirement. Okay, as long as you're satisfied, I just wanted to point that out. Okay. So how do we feel about the language there in terms of W-2? Do we, did, is there, do we need to change it? Steve, do you have a recommendation? Um, well, I think, go ahead, Senator, sorry. Well, I was going to say if Michael, if Michael feels comfortable with what the agency wants to recommend, uh, you know, all fine and good. If if Michael has a question and feels that it's not right, then we ought to stick with our our council's uh, recommends and move move forward with this. My my, my other thought is it's because the sole proprietor has not filed a W-2 form with the IRS, right? That, that's really what they haven't done. Yeah, and they live out of the checkbook. So, so that could be an, an alternative um, because they don't have a W, if they have not filed with the IRS, they don't have a W-2 to submit to the agency. Um, so if you want me to work with Steve or Allison to come up with what the appropriate language there is, I think there's some opportunity to change that. I think it makes sense to, to do something that not only um, we think is right, but something that actually works. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I saw it All right, so, there, Chris. Yeah, I, I just wondered what did a, uh, House Commerce, they tackled this. Is is this language borrowed from them, Michael, or is there? It's it's not actually in Act One Thirty Seven. 
Right? No, no, that you we referenced that the other day uh, <laughs> they were making this change for all ACCD programs, and so right. So what they're doing is that they are saying that sole proprietors can apply, and they're not really referencing the W two form because the W two form was was a, a eligibility requirement that ACCD set up. But I, I will double check with David Hall about that, and if I can find consistency, I'll. I'll to consistency. Thank you. Great. Um, so I want to take you to page nine right now. I want to skip over the change to the next change on page eight. So you wanted a cap um, so that the maximum amount of an award was consistent with the award cap for those farmers markets that had $10,000 of annual gross sales. So um, if you just go with the cap of 10, for 10,000 annual gross sales and under 25, the, the award is $2,500. But do you want the caps for all thresholds to apply? Um, or do you just want it to be at the 2,500 with the concept that most, if not all farmers markets aren't going to have annual gross sales of 25,000 to $49,999? So what's the cap from 10,000 up, Michael? Is there a cap on them? 10,000 to 24,999 is, is the cap is $2,500. The cap for annual gross sales of $25,000 to $49,000 is $5,000. The cap so, for, and then the next cap is, is $10,000 and the, the next cap after that is $20,000. So wouldn't we want a cap for the small guys of less than the next size up? Sure. Well, so you want to. I don't know what the committee would like to do, but say if it was 2000 the cap be $2,000, at least it isn't the same as somebody generating 20000 well, this is for this is for farmers markets that are generate that are making less than ten thousand dollars, right? Right, that's yeah. correct. So, I don't have any strong feelings about this, Bobby. Well, it shouldn't be the same as a bigger farmers. The cap shouldn't be the same as a bigger farmers market from ten to twenty thousand dollars, should it? Should it be a little less? That's my question. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think, Bobby? Do you think two thousand is right? What are the well? I'm just think? throwing that out. Uh, what do the committee members think and feel? Brian, Anthony, Ruth, uh, Chris, what do you think? I'm fine with the two grand. Ra uh, Ruth. I see. Ruth. Well, I. Michael, you, the, I know you told us to ignore the earlier language, but you, there's language about $250,000 that would be set aside for this purpose if there's money right. over. Right, um, so the, I skipped over that because if there are 50 to 70 farmers markets and you're only giving them, say you're giving them $2,500, 50 would be 125,000 and 70 would be 175,000. So uh, an appropriation of up to $250,000 is More too much. Need. Right, I, I, I think limiting it and not setting aside, $250,000 is a lot of money for tiny little farmer's markets that don't even gross 10,000 bucks. So I think limiting it and even limiting it to lower than 2,500. These are tiny little farmers markets and I'd rather see the grants go to farmers and farm operations that are then potentially able to sell their goods at the farmers market. And, you know, it's sort of, 
if we can get the farmers and their products going again, then the farmers markets will be going again. So I don't know. It seems like a lot of money for these teeny tiny farmers markets. Um, so Rodney Graham has his hand up and then Sharon. Rodney? I agree. I think the 2,500 is too much. It should be lowered. Um, okay. Thanks, Rodney. Um, Sharon, what do you think? Um, you know, I, if I remember correctly, and I may be wrong, that um, the, the number of um, that they've had to cut the number of um, vendors in limited space by a certain percentage. Um, and I, I'm wondering if it would be a pain in the butt for the agency to consider just the, the percentage of, you know what, never mind. I'm about to go down a rabbit hole. I think that I agree with, um, I agree. I think that we can do a $2,000 limit because some of these farmers markets, their, their annual income is 5,000. And if they're being compensated, you know, two fifths of their, their, their total, that's, that should take care of them. Well, they're still being well, compensated for their economic harm. And yeah. so it's, it's those expenses and, and other losses that they can submit to the agency. So John uh, O'Brien's hand is up. John, do you want to weigh in? So as it stands now, would the appropriation come from something outside of what we have already appropriated or would it be at the discretion of, of the secretary of AAFM and, and future pooled money down the road, like if dairy's not spent? Well, let's go to page eight then, because that yesterday you said you didn't want it to come from the CRF. You didn't want it to be new CRF funds. Right. Uh, and so it provides that if on October 1, 2020, Corona virus relief funds appropriated to the agency under Act 138 remain unappropriated or unencumbered up to 250,000 is appropriated from the coronavirus relief fund to the agency. That, and that, that might be, should be transferred. Um, 250,000 is transferred from the, coronavirus, from the coronavirus relief funds appropriated to the agency for the purposes of awarding grants to farmers markets in the state that has suffered verifiable loss revenues or expenses caused by COVID-19. So it's, it's about moving the money that's from in dairy, non-dairy, and working lands, whatever amount you want to decide on, to this farmer's market relief assistance program. So it, my thinking behind this whole deal is if we drop, if we drop that figure, see that under $10,000, they were not allowed in before. So we're allowing the small ones in, but set the cap at, at $2,000. And then using Michael's uh, suggested uh, numbers, the 250 is, is quite high. So we could drop that to what, 175 maybe? I, don't, I, I think if there are 50 to 70 farmers markets and they're being reimbursed for their economic losses and other harm caused by COVID, you could set the cap, the maximum amount appropriated at $140,000, right? 70 being the maximum number of farmers markets Yeah. times two, that's 140. And, but you say it's up to 140 to give the agency the discretion to keep, you know, to, to move 100 if only 100 is necessary. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good idea, I think. I see Ruth's hand is up and Chris's hand was up, but go ahead. Go ahead, Ruth. Chris. Chris, you can go. Okay. Michael, I just don't understand why this these gymnastics are necessary because farmers market farmers markets can already apply to the to the non-dairy and the working lands program. What happened is we just didn't put a 
we, we just didn't let the teeny tiny ones apply because we had that $10,000 revenue floor. So if we just create another category from zero to $10,000 and say, they can come in for up to $1,500, that should take care of it. And then we don't have to move funds around. We don't have to create this other separate thing. We just let them into the current program, just create a, a, a smaller tier for them. You would have to change the MTX application, which would shut down the working lands and the non-dairy application for a couple of weeks um, uh, and cost, maybe cost as much as this program would cost. That is so frustrating. Um, Where, whereas if you, if you whereas if you just push this through uh, the agency's normal grant process like you did with the ag fairs, they they already have a process set up for applications, no contractor cost, um, but you got to move the money, um, and so that's that's why the gymnastics are taking place. Uh, I see, okay. Chris? Mine was sort of the same. I, I don't understand why we don't loop them in just to uh, the small producers or whatever. I, I, couldn't we just include them there? But I think you just answered Ruth then, so. That's what I originally did. Um, and then I floated that language by the agency and they said, well, that's going to make us change the application, which has all the negative repercussions <laughs> that you've already heard about no net profit, et cetera. Well, if that's the case, I, I, I don't understand. We're sort of this phraseology and the impact is probably different, but the way it's phrased here, we're sort of saying, if there's any money left over, we'll be happy to help you. Now, I think in reality, there will be money left over by October 1st, but I'm not, that's not my desire not to put them in into a sort of lower priority. I, I just think of them as part of the infrastructure, just like we've treated processors and, and others. Um, but and maybe, to, maybe it's a distinction without a difference. Right. To, to me, this is a waterfall to address the administrative issue of not changing yeah. the application, but still providing yeah. awards to, to small farmers markets. It's, it's not, I mean, it's not ideal and it's not great optics center Pearson. You're right. It does look like you're minimizing them, but if, if you're really looking at a hundred thousand to 140,000, which is what you're doing with a 2000 cap for 50 to 70 farmers markets, I have a pretty good confidence level that there's going to be $100,000 of unspent funds, um, if not a couple of million of unspent funds on, on October 1st. And, and still, the agency can move that money to different areas of the uh, overall programs, right? Right. If it's unexpended, yeah. then it can be repurposed for the other programs. So I... I think we're in pretty good shape um, the way the way Michael has, you know, explained it. Yeah, Bobby, I noticed that Rodney's hand is up and I'm not sure that he forgot to lower it or answer another question, Rodney. I, I forgot to lower it. Okay, thanks but, Rodney. Um, yeah, um, is, is Laura Gunsberg on? Laura Ginsburg is. Uh, I also noticed that John O'Brien's hand is up. So after we, uh, do you have a question for Laura, Rodney? Well, it, it's about uh, verifying whether there'll be some money left. I, on the dairy assistant program, if, if you max out on the milk only, <laughs> and then you subtract the CFAP payment, that you probably got. What happens with that money? Can you apply other expenses for it, or does that? Yeah. Can... Good morning. Hi, Laura. I'm Laura Ginsburg, Agency of Agriculture. I'm happy to talk about the dairy application. 
So some folks are applying and reaching their caps with just milk losses. Um, and then there's a number of programs that people, dairy farmers are applying to that includes CFAP, uh, dairy margin coverage, dairy revenue um, protection, livestock gross margin, that is a duplicative payment that then is reducing their state award because it's the same loss that they're being paid for. So we can't pay for the same loss twice. But farmers are eligible to submit a number of expenses to reach their cap. So it doesn't just have to be milk losses. It could be that they purchased new equipment because they're diversifying their business or they mm -hmm. are a dairy farmer and under the same EIN, they produce maple or grow produce and showed losses in those categories as well. And so we do have some farms that are reaching their cap in those manners, um, not just with milk losses, but typically the larger farms, the LFOs and the larger side of the MFOs are reaching their caps solely on milk loss. I don't so, know if yeah. that answered your question. So what happens to, so if a farm maxes out on milk, you subtract the CFAP and other payments so they don't get paid twice. What happens to that money, those funds? So they would just stay in the, the dairy portion of Senate Bill 351, um, and then we move them around as we are instructed based on the bill language. So there is a good chance there'll be some money in that program, <laughs> even though people are capping out. Right. We anticipate that there will be money left over, particularly because organic dairy farmers are not reaching their caps as quickly um, as conventional farms. And we do have such a large proportion of small farms that are not reaching their caps just on milk price losses. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Carolyn? Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question. I don't know if Laura would answer it or, or who, but... It seems that uh, when COVID hit, uh, cows were selling for $1,500 to $2,000. Once COVID hit, the price of dairy cattle dropped dramatically. Uh, so why wouldn't that be a, a legitimate loss uh, that the farmer suffered uh, if if the price of their animals went from 1500 say to $1,000 and, and their value dropped $500, why isn't, and it's all caused by COVID, why, why wouldn't that be a legitimate uh, cost that they could ask for help on? Thanks for the question, Senator Starr. Um, we are paying people on those losses. So to my knowledge, we've paid probably 30 people or more for losses of replacements or if they've had to beef some of their cows that they otherwise would have been able to sell. What we do is we take, if they sold animals in 2019, we take the average price that they were able to sell animals in 2019 and then the price that they were able to sell them for in 2020 and we pay them on the difference um, per head. And so that is an eligible expense that we are paying, re reimbursing people for. So I, I was just, I just brought that up so Rodney would understand that if they did cap out on the milk they produce, there's many other things that they can ask for help on that are legitimate uh, cost uh, expenses caused by COVID. That's correct. There are a number of farms that haven't sold cows, and so their losses are purely limited to revenue declines from milk price. Um, so it, it's very, it's highly variable, the applications that are coming in. Each one is a unique story into itself. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Uh, John O'Brien's hand is up. Thanks. Thanks for your patience, John. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I just wondered, uh, across all all right, well, you sort of have three pools of, of COVID relief fund, um, and it looks like dairy might have some left over. So I was wondering where, 
we're going to have a lot more demand than than we have money for just so at the end of all this sometime in november that the the agency you know has a chance to to get rid of every last dollar um and and how do they decide that say <clears throat> You know, does would it go all towards working lands because that's really opened up with this new legislation here on sole proprietors, or would it would it move towards the non dairy people um, if if there's a twice as much demand there for what what we appropriated? You've given the agency that flexibility um, to to reallocate or pool to meet the demand from any of the programs. Now the non-dairy and the working lands are first come first serve programs. Um, the dairy was designed to, to address all dairy farmers and their potential losses, or at least give them an award to cover some of their losses. But uh, that, that's gonna be part of what the agency is gonna have to manage when they, when they pool or reallocate is meeting the demand and shifting the funds to meet the demand wherever that demand may come from. Chris? <clears throat> well, yeah. this, to this point, now that we have the experience, I mean, as we designed it, and I remember we went through the spreadsheet and we made some guesses about uptake rates. And literally in the dairy categories, they range between 95 and 100%. And then we had to live with 15 to 20% in uh, non-dairy and somewhere in between for processors. Now, to, to Michael's point, I think this language allows the agency to make up for, for the, the, you know, acknowledge the, the actual data we're seeing. But uh, is there any reason why we would be a little more assertive as you say michael it's first come first serve for everything but dairy um and the reality is you know i, I guess i just worry about the timing so so right up into some point the program looks empty the first come first serve dynamic hits and people and and the agency is potentially having to say sorry and then they shuffle money and then the next person that comes in is in line. Is there, do we, should we, and have we thought of any protection to smooth that out as we have to acknowledge that the, the assumptions, understandably, that we made in June are not totally bearing out? There is language on page six that says, if the secretary reallocates or pools, the secretary shall do so in an equitable manner designed to provide assistance to as many of the eligible applicants as possible. I don't know if that it fully addresses your concern. Um, but it is, a, it is that directive. Is it possible for us to have some language and this, we, we kind of brought this up yesterday and it was tricky, so I'll let it go if people are sick of this. But I worry about somebody that applies on September 28th is told, no, there's no more cash. And then it turns out there's cash on October 2nd. And is there some language we could have that would allow the agency at least the permission to to go back or to, to look back at, or maybe it's already in there, or maybe I'm the only yeah. one that thinks this makes sense. I but. thought... I thought we already fixed that no application would <clears throat> would be denied. It would just be held for the next round of money to come through. I, I thought we'd already done that. Well, well, no, no not necessarily. Um, you've you've provided that if an application comes in before October first, it's going to be it's going to be. Um, processed uh hold on a second i'm trying to find that language if the secretary elects to reallocate or pool coronavirus relief funds the secretary shall process applica applications received on or before october 1 2020 in the order received and shall issue awards from the program fund for which ap each application was submitted 
Um, and, and that's to address the, the concerns of, of equity and priority for those people who submitted their applications before October 1st um, and to not have to pause their applications um, during the reallocation of funds. Um, and I'm trying to find the latest dairy update from Diane um, to the latest CRF update from Diane to look at how much money is still available in each of those programs. I and have so, those numbers if you'd like. Sure, Laura. that'd be great, Laura. Sorry to interrupt instead of uh, you having to dig through. So as of yesterday, we finalized um, paying an additional portion of grantees. So we paid out 167 dairy applicants at $5,691,507.08. So that's the total that's been appropriated from the 21.2 million. And then for non-dairy, how much is left in non-dairy? We've run our first payment this week. We're testing to make sure it works. There's four awards that are going through across the two bills that total $95,000. Right. So Senator Pearson, I think everyone applying before October 1st from any of the existing programs. And, and uh, let's just close the, the loop, Lar. How much is left in working lands? So there's um, $8.5 million across the three funding streams. I, I don't have exactly the which bills those are pulling from. But sure. Assuming sure. that there's two from each, it's only $40,000. Um, right. from each of the bills. So a very minimal impacts yet. So I'd say the majority of funds are still available. Right, and when Laura references the three streams, there's the non-dairy in Act 138, there's um, the working lands in the ACCD Act 137, and then there was another million dollars in working lands and just the appropriations bill. So those are the three streams into the non-dairy working lands and there's eight and a half million that's still available for people applying under those programs. There's gonna be money available on October 1st. So anybody applying before October 1st gets processed underneath their program. After October 1st, the agency has discretion to take whatever's left from the 21.2 and whatever's left from the 8.5 and pool and address the greatest need for demand. So we've got, we're gonna have $30 million and after October one uh, to hand out. I think it's probably be, gonna be closer to $20 million um, and 25 maybe. 20 um, what? Yeah, to move, to reallocate. Okay, John's hand has been up for a while, and then I see Ruth's hand, actual hand is up. John, do you want to go ahead? I just wondered when when we'll know if Dairy has any leftover money because they have the opportunity right to apply with an addendum, and so if if we have to wait till the very end, um, say there we we get a second wave of of small certified dairy farmers who haven't reached their cap applying because of September milk is down. Um, will there be a, a moment there between November and, and December when, when there might be leftover money that gets dispersed? If any. So the, the application deadline for both the initial application and any addendum has been moved to November 15th. So on November 15th, all applications should be in including the addendum for dairy and the agency should have a snapshot of what's left over. Considering the time to process applications, 
Um, and the fact that applications will be rolling in probably up until November 15th, there, there's going to be money that's available at that point um, on November 15th. And enough, enough time for a turnaround, say the non-dairy farmers maxed out their appropriation. So between well, November 15th and December. Yeah, well, the, the agency said November 15th, they've been taking about 20, three to four weeks, let's just say three to four weeks to process an application. Um, and then the money has to revert on December 20th. So if you use three to four weeks with that December 20th deadline, uh, the money that the agency has opportunity to move all that money in that time frame. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's not, I'm not trying to minimize what it's going to take. The agency is going to, agency is going to have a rough holidays <laughs> or um, a holiday up to that holiday season. It's going to be busy. Great. Ruth? Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, so just uh, following up on John's question, if the in the non-dairy um, portion of the program, we have those caps and the maximum cap, I believe, is $20,000. Mm -hmm. And we put those caps in because there were so many potential applicants that we didn't want one big or a few big operations to, to suck up all the money. But if there is so much money left, um, those caps may be unnecessarily restrictive. And I know that we don't wanna have to change the application, but is it, is it possible for if we have a, you know, a big beef operation or poultry operation or vegetable operation that has more than $20,000 of losses, would they be moved into the working lands program and then be able to get a larger award um, to cover their losses? I see that's, a, that's a question for the agency. Anyone from the agency want to try that? Steve, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Senator Hardy. Yes, the uh, actually the working lands program is specifically designed and to accomplish that. So if there is somebody who is a fit the eligibility criteria, any of the group, or what if you fit within 351 eligibility criteria, you have revenue, excuse me, you have revenue over $250, and that's the same criteria used for the working lands group, then the cap is $50,000. Every business S351's actual is $1,000 if they meet that criteria. Now that that raises the question of fun flexibility, and that we're asked to be able to do, be able to transfer the funds. Another on the on the money that we expect to have left over. I I I'm not. I think we're going to have as much money left over as just been talked about. I don't know, but the the figures that Laura gave didn't address the pending application. We have approximately 75 completed pending applications in both the dairy program and in the non-dairy ag producer program. So there's about 150 applications pending that we need to review and probably most, almost all of them will be eligible for an award. And just the nature of the beast is people wait until the end. And the current deadline is October 1st. And there's a real incentive if you're a producer to wait until the deadline if you haven't met your cap. So that's one of the reasons we want to preserve that October 1 deadline is this system, these promises have been put in place. So everybody that's coming into that, we make sure that they can get what they're eligible for. So I think we're going to be spending a lot of money with applications by October 1. And then the, the question is, how do we make sure we can spend all the rest of it before November 15th? Great. Okay. I saw Chris's hand does up. Thank you. Could someone at the agency, uh, is there a plan to go to the press and, and alert the people that actually they're, they're, you know, that we haven't had the uptake we've assumed we would have and farmers and, and food producers, blah, 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 and encourage that? I mean, I, I do think that would be a smart strategy, but I'm curious 
what what you all are planning. God. So, do you want to address that? Bro? Sure, I can start, Steve, and happy for you to add in some more feedback. Um, we sent out just this week a newsletter reminder to about 5,000 people who make up our marketing newsletter to remind them that the deadlines are approaching. And this week, we're having a number of meetings with advocacy organizations that represent large groups of farmers to make sure that they understand the application and can provide information to their members. We are seeing um, a lot of interest in the applications. I think folks um, are taking their time to do it right, which is what we've encouraged people to do it so that we can process their payments more quickly. But we are putting out uh, those weekly emails to every person that we have registered at the agency, which is between four and 5,000 um, emails a, a, a week to remind people that the applications are open, that they should apply, where to find the resources. So it is it is getting out there. I think people are just really busy this time of year. It looks like Representative Partridge is sharing that exact email that maybe she got from our marketing yes. blast. Yeah, this is, uh, I got it both on my personal email and my ledge email, just as application deadlines approaching, top five tips for completing your agriculture and working lands application. So this yep. is, it's really helpful, actually. <clears throat> so are, are we in pretty good shape with our language, uh, Michael? So uh, let's talk about what the changes would be. I would fix the typo on page seven, line 14. I would reduce the cap for the farmer's markets to 2000 and subsequently or consequently reduce the amount uh, that would be uh, moved um, from the CRF funds in Act 138 to the farmer's market relief assistance program from 250 to a maximum of 140,000. Yeah. Uh, and then I think that is it. Yeah, and and uh, <clears throat> Carolyn. Oh, and, are, and I'm sorry. The the agency and I are going to talk about yeah. the language about inability to provide a W two or submit a W two or file a W two, and uh, get some agreement on that. Um, so, the, I, I noticed that John's hand was up, and I don't know, John, if uh, you want to go ahead before we move on to this. Yeah, just, just a quick question. I was wondering if, if there's such pandemic fatigue that, you know, judging from the Vermont, Vermont's response to the U.S. Census, say, say their unexpended funds um, December 20th um, across all these categories, is, is there some sort of... Uh, catchment we can put in that that the secretary then could use anything left over for you know standing up the program or some something that just so it doesn't have to go anywhere else um because i i can see that happening even if it's you know a hundred thousand dollars given the caps and and how how tired people are of filling out forms <clears throat> well Any, I, anyone I anyone <laughs> Well, the process we've just gone through allows the secretary great uh, movement of monies all the way across the, all the programs we put together. So if I don't know how much more leeway and freedom we could give the agency uh, to use up the money. I mean, we can't go door to door and hand it out. So, um, uh, Ruth? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Bobby that we've given a ton of flexibility, uh, hopefully, to the agency to yeah. help them spend this money. And, um, <clears throat> you know, if there's $100,000 left and it goes into the UI fund, then that's not terrible. I mean, our UI fund is getting, you know, used pretty, pretty uh, well. So I, I don't think that that's 
a horrible outcome. It's it's good to to beef up that fund if if there's. But I'm pretty confident that the agency can spend this money if they're creative and do a lot of outreach and and really get to farmers and processors, et cetera. Um, just one more plug since I have, <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, Bobby and Carolyn, if we could maybe hear from uh, uh, the Michael Snyder and see how the forestry money is going and if there are any changes necessary there and if they've been able to spend that money. Because we, we put a lot of money into mm -hmm. that pot too. So uh, well, just the, I, I would be, I'd be glad to do that, Ruth. Um, the last time uh, Michael reported to us, I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, they had um, they had dealt out quite a bit of money. And, and one of our the questions for me was, uh, is there any place that we could scoop some of the COVID money to use it for something else? And it was pretty clear that with the number of applications that hadn't been uh, yet finalized and considered that there was, I think it was um, the 3.6 million, 3.1 million had been um, basically claimed. There was an additional half million that was um, under review, but they thought would be up, uh, approved. And then there was 1.4 million that yeah, left uh, of the 5 million, but there were, and I can, this is the number, I'm not gonna remember the number of applications that had been submitted, but they felt that it it would be, you know, probably close if not used if up. 50, 54 applications have been submitted, uh, but not finalized. And I think that there was 1.4 million left to cover those, Mike. Do you remember? 1.25. Okay, thanks. And I can forward Sam Lincoln's summary from September 3rd to whomever would like it. Which isn't to say, Ruth, that I don't want to hear from Michael. I'm happy to, if you'd like to. Our next meeting is Friday at 8.30 in the morning. So I don't know if you want to hop onto that or what. Um, I'm curious about the timeline for this language. I think we have a pretty good idea of what it is. And I think um, House Ag members have basically approved what was sent out this morning. And, you know, and I'm not quite sure what, you know, what our next step will be to actually finalize it other than us voting on it on Friday. Bobby, what do you need? Well, <clears throat> aren't you gonna, are you going to try to get that into the approach bill or have you talked with Kitty about handling this? I've, I've talked to Kitty and to Chip Conquest who handles this aspect of the budget. And their, uh, their feeling was that you were, you know, my understanding was that you were going to put it in on the Senate side, they would be prepared for it. And uh, knowing that we had accepted it, they would be uh, on board with it. Okay, because um, of course we haven't got the bill yet, but it's, I guess it, you're debating that now in the, on the House side, right? I think it's tomorrow we're gonna debate it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you gonna, did you say you were gonna have uh, Michael Schneider and Friday? Well, if Ruth wants to hear from him and you can join us, we could do that. Um, but Mike, uh, but Michael, uh, also could, has his last report, which he could forward to you. I don't know if there's been any change, but I'm happy to have Michael in if you'd like to to do that. What time are What time are you meeting, Carolyn? Eight thirty to ten thirty, just like today. Yeah. Would the Senate committee like to meet the first thing, or do you just want to get a copy of the report and we'll add it on to our bill if? if we need to after we talk with um, Michael. Either way for me. Pardon? Either way for me. I could yep. join the House Committee or just get the report. Uh, well, Any... if, if, Michael, if Michael could send out the report, I'd like to at least look at it and, and uh, 
you know, I would be interested in, you know, hearing from Michael and getting to ask him questions. <laughs> um, well, but uh, especially if we're considering any changes, you know, I, I would, I think the Senate committee should hear directly if we're considering changes, but. Um, well, why don't we, we'll have Linda try, you want me to, what time on, on Friday? 8.30 is when we, our slot is, I, what I'll do right now is I'll text Michael and see if he's available. And then Michael, uh, then uh, uh, Linda can follow up. Well, we just want to get a report from him. So uh, we could meet uh, an hour before the floor time if if that's agreeable with the committee. So at sure. 1030? Sure. 10 sure. OK, so the Senate will meet at 1030 with Michael, and you can meet whenever. Uh, if we can get him to come, Linda can line that up. Okay, so our our slot of time for meeting is from 8.30 till 10.30. Um, so if you wanna have him separately, then that's okay. I don't know if my committee actually needs to hear from him again, uh, because we heard from him last week or the week before. Oh, and those yeah, numbers we're... that Michael was, ta I was talking about were the numbers that he had reported to us at that moment, so. Um, so we can work this out. Um, John O'Brien's hand is up, by the way. So I'd like to call on him before we end here. Oh, just while we have everybody on, I, I was wondering about agritourism. And from what I think we heard in some of these hearings was that, that commerce was running through their money. And I was thinking with with fall foliage coming up, um, you know, what happened? Say, say Rodney Graham's farm has bus tours. They're not coming this fall, um, could he apply through these ag relief funds or would it all be, have to go through commerce? Well, working lands must handle stuff like that. Anybody so know up, the answer to that question? It's up, it's up to the farmer slash agribusiness person to decide which bucket to go after. I'm happy to provide some information on that if that'd be helpful. Go so ahead, an agritourism operator who's purely an agritourism operator who is not a farmer or qualifies under one of the other categories would not be eligible to apply under the Agriculture and Working Lands Grant Program. If they are a farmer, for example, um, that may run like you were like you were stating if representative Graham is a farmer and then also runs bus tours he could apply for the losses for the bus tours underneath his agricultural um, application but businesses that are have no connection to agriculture or working lands are cannot um, apply under that program so it would be and we ask those people to apply in commerce because that is the better fit for them and, and Laura, let's say uh, you have a small farm that, um, you know, raises emus or sheep or something, and they also do weddings on site. Um, so the wedding part of it wouldn't count? It does count. Oh, so does. we do not require a percentage of loss to come from agricultural sales versus some other kind of sales. You have to, if you are applying as a farmer, for example, there is the $10,000 um, in sales from ag products required. So if you're a farmer and you meet that threshold, you can claim $6,000 in loss from not being able to sell your zucchini and $15,000 in loss from not being able to rent your farm out for weddings. So as long as you're meeting the thresholds to be an eligible applicant, the losses can come from a multiple um, variety of enterprises that you may run under the same business tax identification number. Great. And and can that tax identification number also be your social security number if you're a sole proprietor? Yes, that's correct. The application guides you into how to um, how to put that in. And so sole proprietors are completely eligible right now to apply using their social security number. <clears throat> Thanks. You're welcome. So uh, the Senate uh, committee, are, are you all agreeable to the language that we've gone over this morning? And so we can let Michael wrap that up. And, yes. 
And Michael, um, I guess it all, everybody looks like with a thumbs up. Would, would you wanna make sure we all get a copy plus uh, send a copy to Jane in approach, Senator Kitchell? Sure, I'll get a copy to all the committee members, uh, Senator Kitchell, Stephanie Barrett, and, and, and the agency. Yeah, and probably send one to uh, Tim Ash as well. Uh, sure. So that we're all on the same page. Okay. Uh, well, any, uh, Chris? Well, just in, in terms of the bill, so you're saying that the current plan is that the Senate adds it to the budget? Well, that's what we talked about yesterday and Jane wasn't clear. I guess she hadn't talked with Kitty to see, you know, for sure what, what the house was doing, but Tim and Mitzi are working out some of those details as well. But sure. Don't be surprised if it gets tacked on to the uh, budget bill. Okay, I mean, I, I, I'd be interested in it moving in the fastest moving vehicle. Right. But, uh, it, the budget obviously is a safe moving train in that sense. So uh, I'll leave that to you. But uh, if we keep an eye out in case there's something that's moving faster, maybe we could go there just so farmers get some certainty uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, but if you if you decide to do that, make sure it's a vehicle that the house is going to be uh, willing to um, pass. And yeah. give me a heads up so I can alert people that that's what's happening. Yeah, no, no, we'll we got to keep everybody on the same page here, so that's very important. Right. Good. Um, how do you like the weed whacking? Are you talking to me? Yeah, can you hear the weed whacker? Oh, is that, uh, not really, <laughs> I can't, but there is some kind of noise behind you, that's true, I hadn't noticed it. <laughs> it's like when my windows are open, the sheep start blatting and I'm going, oh my gosh, but people don't tend to hear them, so. <laughs> You're muted, Bobby. I thought I'd shut it up. Um, we're all set. I think oh. we're all set. I we're gonna. Uh, Steve has his hand up. I think we're gonna oh. go on till ten thirty. So I'll get. Um, I think. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say it right now. House members, um, with a thumbs up, do you feel good about where we've gotten with this language? Okay. Terry, um, Rodney, yes. Cynthia, do you want to say? I know you're new to this, Cynthia, but um, if you'd like to say a word, you're welcome to. I'm, I'm good with where we are. I think uh, you're doing the best you can to design this so the money gets out in the best way possible. I feel very strongly that it's really good if it can go in the budget because we know that's going to move. I understand what Senator Pearson was saying about something moving faster, but I don't want to take any chances of somehow this getting dropped. So I, I think it should be in the budget, but that's up to you guys. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll figure that out. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. So it looks like we're good with this language and we'll just look for the, you know, the final product and uh, go from there. Um, if you all are going to meet with Michael Snyder on Friday at 1030, um, then, you know, feel free. Um, I don't know that we need to, um, and I'm not, no, I don't know that we need to meet, but um, we'll, we'll figure that out. And we'll be talking yeah. to um, you all, meaning house yep. members. For the next little bit here so well uh thank you carolyn and your committee and uh, michael and steve and the ag agency for all their hard work um and uh so committee will plan to meet friday morning at 10 30 and hopefully um, 
we'll have Michael uh, Schneider uh, there. Linda can arrange that. So if there's anything else you want to bring up for Friday morning, uh, get hold of me or, or call Linda and we'll get on it. So Bobby, Bobby, yes. where are you? I'm in Newport, <laughs> Vermont. Oh. <laughs> You're at the Starbucks in North Troy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I had a meeting out here and I didn't have time to get back to North Troy before you guys wanted to start. So I said, well, I'll, I'll hop on out there and now we'll get headed back. Good. Bobby, I'm so glad you were able to make this work and thank you to your committee members. We're going we're gonna to hang on a little bit because I want to talk sure. about um, farmers markets, but, and you're welcome to join us, but um, um, so House members hang on and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll see you. And thanks so much for being able to join us this morning. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right, gang. Um, so I just wanted, I mentioned farmers markets uh, when we last met and Abby was on this call for a little while and, and we don't need to get her back on, but um, I, I did have a constituent who runs one of the larger uh, markets, win, winter markets. And um, she's really concerned about the, uh, you know, the guidelines and what have you. And I did, I did get um, a message from Abby um, saying that they are working with folks. Uh, so um, I'm going to connect with my constituent to make sure that she's kind of in the loop. But um, at any rate, I, I just wanted you all to know that there is work being done. I don't know if anybody on the call right now or on the meeting uh, wants to comment about this. Um, I know this is kind of Abby's bailiwick, but uh, in terms of making sure that winter farmers markets can meet and um, be an outlet for uh, our farmers' pro uh, products, um, you know, I think it's pretty important if we possibly can. So, um, I don't know, Steve or Laura, um, if you if you want to say a few words, that you don't have to though. You weren't, you know, asked to do this, and I I don't I don't want you to feel like you've been ambushed. <laughs> I, well, thank you, and I, and I don't, and I appreciate the opportunity. So the agency does obviously wants to have uh, farmers markets in the winter, but there's an internal process with the administration. And so we are working on an outreach, and as you said, Abby is um, principally responsible for it, but we're working on an outreach with farmers markets. And what we plan to do is develop a plan that then goes through an administrative review process, which includes the Department of Health. And ultimately, obviously, the, the governor makes the decision, but I think the governor relies, or at least the governor's office, but I think the governor's relies heavily on, on the medical opinion. So I think, as far as I know, everyone wants to have uh, winter's markets this winter. I think, like everything with this virus, some of the decisions will depend on the conditions on the ground at the time. Last spring, Obviously, the all markets were ordered outside, so we haven't been in the situation yet where we're having indoor markets. We do hope to do that, plan to do that, but I think the, the medical opinion will probably hold sway depending on how we're doing. If we continue to do well, then I'd be very optimistic. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but we are, we are aware that farmers markets need to be planning for their winter's markets and to know the guidelines, so it's, it's definitely a priority and, and it is something that we're working on. Okay, great, Steve. Thanks so much for that. Any questions for Steve? Uh, Vicki, your hand is up. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, well, we have you, Steve, and whoever else knows a lot more about this than me. I'm wondering about the expenses of an actual farmer's market, um, you know, that we want to give them some money to help keep them going. But obviously, you have your vendors who bring their own uh, wares and set up their tables, whatnot. But what are the expenses of a farmer's market? Is it advertising or renting a space? Could you elaborate a little bit on what they're dealing with? Well, Laura probably knows uh, more than I do about the specifics, but I think they're what you stated. I mean, a, lo a lot of the direct expenses came from PPE, potentially setting up sinks, potentially, um, you know, having all of the 
reducing their vendors, they lost fees, it's not necessarily an expense, but because it, especially markets that were confined to a smaller space, given the six foot, there was never a, there was never a quota on how many, how, on a farmer's markets, they were, there were some vendors initially that couldn't come that weren't involved in essential activities, but farmer's markets were never restricted by an occupancy rate, but they did have distance requirements. So if you have a small farmer's market and you have to have at least six foot between all the tables, then obviously you're limited in what you can produce. But the one, I think they've also had reduced um, guests because of the, because of some of the requirements, because of some of the lines, because of the single file. But I think primarily the expenses that are the additional expenses because of the coronavirus have been related to protecting the employees, protecting customers, have probably they have more people on on staff, including the health safety officer, to make sure that people are following the guidelines. But Laura may have bit more specifics that she could add as well. Thanks, Steve. I'm actually looking at an application from one of the farmers markets for what they're applying for, and it looks like their income um, comes primarily from rental of space for the vendors to vend. And then their expenses include advertising, compensation for the market manager, equipment, which would be to process EBT or other kinds of payments, or if they're doing electronic payments um, to support their the vendors that are there. And then insurance, music, and supplies. And then this particular farmer's market added, as Steve alluded to, in their other economic harm section, hand washing station rentals that are portable, um, sneeze guards for the market manager's booth, face shields, and then um, hand sanitizers and hand sanitizing ser service stations. So those would be the portable areas where you can put a hand sanitizer machine that they can move around and put in place during the market. And that's what we would anticipate to see from a number of markets is a reduction in the income from vendor fees um, and then additional expenses to ensure safety of the folks who are vending, their staff, and the people who are coming to purchase at the market. So one of one of the concerns um, that and I've got her email up here, uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, be candid that this is uh, Sherry Marr from uh, Athens. I don't think she'd mind if I shared this with you. She said. We, we typically have 40 plus applications and then have to determine who is fortunate enough to secure one of the 30 spots we have available. This year, only about a dozen of my previous vendors are currently prepared to make that commitment. And as vendor fees are what cover market operation costs, we along with many other markets, both indoors and out are quite concerned about making ends meet for this season and surviving the pandemic. Um, so, um, at any rate, <clears throat> she created quite an extensive draft outline, which um, I, I, I don't think she would mind if I forwarded to you all, but um, um, should I forward that to Abby, do you think? And she may have already sent it, I'm not exactly sure, um, but um, I, I, you know, and maybe I'm making more of a big um, deal of this than I should, but. It seems like a planning ahead might be a good thing. And I, I'm sure you are, all are planning ahead. But. We, we'd be happy to see it, um, Madam Chair. We, we're happy. We, uh, I don't know whether Abby has seen that yet or not, but we are responsible for at least developing a plan and then it will be subject to subsequent approval but, or, or not, hopefully approval. But it okay. is an important issue. And it is it is something that we need to um, address in the near future. There's a there's an additional point that I would love to raise if you would if you would uh, allow me. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Thanks. So, the first of all, I really appreciate all the work all of you are doing to give us more flexibility to get this money to farmers' hands. There is one thing we briefly touched upon yesterday that I think could really help, and that's and this is this relates to the potential congressional extension of the coronavirus relief fund deadlines. And I think Mike said yesterday that the General Assembly is thinking about doing that broadly for all coronavirus relief fund dollars. And what I mean is if Congress extends the December 30th deadline, then we could then also extend our deadlines. 
So I, I think that would be incredibly helpful because if it is extended, then we, there's no question that there's more harm than we have money. The question is whether we can get everyone in the door and can get people to spend it. So one thing would be extending the deadlines as we discussed yesterday. And if people are interested in this, I'd be happy to work with Mike on proposed language. And I wanted to raise this when the Senate was still with us and I'm sorry that I didn't. Um, but the other piece of that is, not only extending the deadlines, but if we had more time, we could potentially raise the caps and allow the same people who have already shown their losses to come back in the door. So for instance, if Congress extended the deadline for CRF's uh, uh, expenditures until June, then we could create arguably a whole new application that allowed people to come in for their new losses. So people are continuing to accumulate losses as we go. We don't have the time to do that because the time frame is too short. Right now, we have LFOs that might have a million dollars in losses that were capped out at $100,000. So it would be very easy to spend this money and get it to people who need it if we had that time and flexibility. So all I'm suggesting is if we had a contingency plan for congressional change, it might also include giving the agency the flexibility to do something with the caps. Maybe it's double them, maybe it's maybe make, make them 50% bigger and to, because right now people are restricted to one, one application, but that's something that's done by state law, not by federal law, except for the dairy addendum. But we could also allow people who've already received a grant to come back in to apply for subsequent losses. So we could have this kind of catch all provision if Congress acts that would make, I think getting all of this money into agriculture farmers and others hands fairly easy to do. Just a suggestion. Well, um, I think you're right. It would have been good if you had mentioned this while the Senate was still on. I tried. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, um, I, and I, I'm sorry if I neglected to call on you. Um, no, I, and I, I'm also noticing that John Bartholomew's hand is up. But I wonder, Michael, if you wanted to say anything about this, uh, you know, uh, potential language. Um, I think that's possible, but it may not be as easy as um, you may think. Uh, in addition, you will be back or many of you will be back in January. So if the, the deadline is extended beyond December 30th, you will have opportunity in the next session to amend caps um, amounts, eligibility, et cetera, at that time. Um, and instead of delegating that to the agency in a kind of vague grant. Um, so that's, that's, you have options. You can try to do it as Steve summarized, or you can mm -hmm. do it when you come back in January. Okay. All right. I, I think that the the next conversation would be with um, with Bobby, potentially, Steve, if you want to reach out to Senator Starr to see if that's something he thinks that could be um, pulled off at this point. I think it's too late to include it in our budget on the, you know, on the House okay. side. So. Um, Understood. Thank you. Yeah, not trying to cut off conversation, but John, why don't you go ahead and Sharon also has her hand up. I wanted to, to go back to the topic of farmers markets. Okay. Um, I am, I'm pleased that the governor and the agency are, are really looking at scientific evidence and, and medical advice and making decisions, but I'm still concerned that farmers markets might be held to a higher standard than supermarkets. And um, I don't know about the rest of you, but that's where I feel at greatest risk at supermarkets. But um, I, I, I think it's in many cases, farmers markets are safest places, safer places to be. So I really, want, I'm, I really urge the agency when looking at the regulations for winners farmers markets to look at ma making sure that they aren't being held to a higher standard. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Sharon? Thanks. I, I, I heard the little tornado of conversation about um, being able to respond as a gen general assembly 
if the feds do extend mm -hmm. the deadlines and um is is that I, i'm just trying to imagine if the if the feds extended the deadline by 30 days when the session the new session starts you know it's it's into the beginning of january and by the time everything's said and done it, it might not actually provide a whole lot of opportunity um you know if it takes three weeks to to get that done and then the governor to sign it might only actually provide an additional week of of opportunity to to get those monies to the people who and businesses who need them i'm wondering um i'm wondering if there's any way to tack into this just saying if the federal if 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 the feds extend it that we would extend our deadline by the same number of days that the feds extend the deadline I mean, just to match it exactly with whatever the feds do instead of dictating. I mean, is, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm just wondering if that might be a nice little piece of data to have in there so that the agency could continue to work without a hiccup. I don't know the answer to that. I would look to either Michael or Steve. Well, that's that's a concept we're thinking about um, of extending any deadline for application um, payment or reversion by the same number of days that the federal government under whatever act um, extends deadlines for um, award of coronavirus relief funds originally appropriated under the CARES Act. So that, that's, that's basically what we're looking at. Steve is asking for in addition, that says if the federal government extends the deadlines for reversion or expenditure of uh, the CRF funds, that the agency will, shall have the discretion to change the amounts and potentially even the eligibility criteria for awards um, from coronavirus uh, relief funds awarded to the agency under Act 138 or otherwise. So I, that's, that's possible. Um, I just, I, back to the, you, you will likely have more than 30 days, I would think. Um, and so you're still gonna have that, I think that option in January or February to, to amend it. And, you know, Mm -hmm. The budget adjustment bill gets passed in like 35 days. So, and I've seen you pass the entire body pass a bill in one day from introduction in the house to signature by the governor. Um, yes, I've seen that too. Can't remember what one it was, Michael, but chronic wasting wow. disease. <laughs> chronic wasting disease. Yep. So it, yeah. it can be done. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a, you, I see your concerns are real, Representative Fagard, um, but I'm just, you have opportunity. If you don't, if you're anxious about exercising that opportunity under a limited time frame, you could probably give the agency some discretion. But, but Michael, you're talking about more of a blanket. It sounds like a, there's a blanket um, proposal being uh, thought about. So is that, is that something that will show up at some place in some place or way? Yeah, I, I've, I've floated the idea to JFO and to the ledge council attorneys that are kind of the point people for CRF funding. It's out there. Um, we're, okay. we're aware of it and uh, it's either going to be included in the appropriations bill or if for some reason it breaks down, it can be included in individual bills as well. So it's it's being worked on. Okay, thanks. Um, so John, I see your hand up. John John uh, Bartholomew, is it uh, still up or or do you have another? Okay, John O'Brien's hand is up also. John, what happens to any new monies available between now and and the next biennium? I mean, probably not likely, but if 
the the Congress say came up with a new you know Corona relief fund in in this sort of lame duck session now, or some of the money set aside here in the state that was Corona money, uh, Corona relief money um, was made available. How how do we weigh in on that? Um, I I think that depends on how the money is moved from the feds. Uh, for example, um, some of the programs have moved the money to the governor and, and not to, to the General Assembly or the state as a whole. So if that happened, then the, the governor, ha and depending on how the money was moved, the governor might have significant discretion and you might not have much to say. Um, and that has happened in some states. But uh there's also a constitutional issue with that in vermont because no money can be expended from the state treasury without an act of the general assembly um so where does the money go if it's appropriated to the governor does it just like you put it in people's union bank and you know or uh or you put it in the treasury so th there's a question constitutionally about that um there is some authority for joint fiscal committee to expend money um, when the general assembly is not in session uh, so you would probably look at that but ultimately um and the governor has the ability to call you back into session you know whenever if you want to come back around thanksgiving or christmas um, uh, but th there's that possibility, but ultimately I think there would probably be enough time built in for a legislature to act in order to move the money, the new money. Um, just as you know, the, the CARES <laughs> Act gave nine months effectively from passed in March and the reversions December 30th. So I think you'd see something like that. Right. Thanks, Michael. We are so fortunate to have you, Michael, working for us and with us. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions, uh, gang? It's uh, about 10 o'clock. We have another half hour. I don't need, know that we need to, to um, use it. Um, I did hear back from Michael Snyder. He is going to meet with the um, Senate at 1030. And he says that he's available for us as well. Um, we heard from him at some point, and, uh, but I'm happy to have him in on Friday if, if you would like another update. It's uh, sort of up to you. Uh, I see Rodney's hand is up. Rodney, why don't you go ahead? Think about my question. Um, I, I know myself, I got plenty to do if we're just, you know, going to talk about what ifs or uh, just see Michael Snyder if just the fact to see him. But anyway, where do we stand on the, you know, the on-farm slaughter? Are we just going to ignore that or we could talk about that or? Um, I think that's a difficult one, uh, Rodney. Um, I know we've heard that there's, um, <clears throat> there's a feeling that there's a need for increased numbers um, the, the unfortunate thing is that when the survey was done, um, the question about whether they report to the agency or not was um, not included on their survey. And it's hard to make the argument that you need more slaughter um, if you, we don't know what the numbers are. So, um, so this is, and it's a tough one. It's, uh, I had encouraged the advocates to weigh in with the speaker because we are supposed to be dealing with only budget and COVID related issues. You might make an argument that it's, um, it's a COVID related issue, uh, but it, it's also interesting about the, um, you know, the number of animals that are, um, you know, that are being raised. So, um, uh, Rodney, do you have any feelings about that? Well, I don't, I 
can't understand how you can claim it to be a COVID related issue because uh, the slaughterhouse is being backed up as people getting their animals in to be slaughtered for themselves or some have licenses to have animal slaughter to sell. But that doesn't, if that's not the case on our, on farm slaughter, I mean, you can't take, I can't take my animal to some other farm and have them slaughter so that I can sell the meat. I mean, that that's just not doable. Um, and uh, so I, I, I'm, the fact that they won't report or haven't reported, I, I'm not in favor of raising the numbers at all. Um, I just want to know where if we if that's the case, then you know that's fine. I don't want to I don't want to raise the numbers, but if the committee was going to talk about it, sometime we should talk about it. I mean, if we're not going to talk about it, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Rodney. Uh, Sharon's hand is up. Sharon, go ahead. Um, I on the on farm slaughter thing. You know, we um, we had been using uh, the local USDA slaughter facility here and um, it was going to be mid to late January before we could get our lambs into them. So uh, we, because we sell whole animals and not cuts, uh, we're, we're using a, a different operation and um, the, the father, you know, runs the, the cutting and everything. The son comes out and, and, and slaughters the animals and, and does the basics and, and takes them. But, but if for some reason that falls through for us, um, you know, if we were maybe a larger operation that had a, a fair number of on-farm slaughter lambs and then we were planning to, 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 um, to sell cuts from a certain number of our animals and we couldn't get in because the slaughterhouse said, you know what, we're not doing lambs anymore. That could create a problem. That's not the situation we're in though. I'm a little bit nervous um, about, um, you know, the new, the new operation that we're trying has a good reputation, but um, so it's not, it is a, it is a real potential issue, I think, especially for those who are maybe doing lambs or, or goats, where there's uh, not the same profit margin for the slaughter facilities or the processing facilities. But, um, but I do think it's hard to make the argument without the numbers. But how many people are going to fill out that survey honestly and say, oh, no, I, I do on-farm slaughter, but I don't report to the agency when they're supposed to be reporting to the agency? It's it's kind of a catch twenty well, two, but it goes back to what I said. I don't if you if you do a non farm slaughter without inspection, I don't think you can sell the meat. Well, no, you sell Legally. the whole animal. Yeah, you sell the whole animal. Um, you yeah, you can't sell cuts. But yep. Mike, do you want to weigh in here? You unmuted yourself. Yeah. Um, so the Federal Meat Inspection Act regulates uh, the slaughter and sale of meat. But it has some exceptions to the requirement for inspection of the slaughter prior to sale. And one of those exceptions is what's called the personal slaughter exception, is that the owner of the animal can slaughter it themselves and then provide it uh, to the friends and family or unpaying guests. And so what the on-farm slaughter law in Vermont does, it allows a person to purchase an animal from a farm and then slaughter that animal themselves or arrange for an itinerant slaughterer to slaughter that animal themselves on the farm where the animal is purchased. That, according to USDA, when we did it, would qualify provided that the slaughter occurred in sanitary conditions, which is an overall requirement for slaughter under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. So you have to work 
with the on-farm slaughter law underneath the umbrella of personal slaughter um, and under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. And so it's, it does allow you to, to half or quarter the animal and Vermont's on-farm law does that. So you don't need to sell it whole, you can cut the animal. Um, now, when the on-farm slaughter law was enacted, there were serious uh, concerns raised by the agency about, um, about sanitation, about maintaining uh, the product so that it's not adulterated, so that the Vermont brand um, is not uh, impaired in any way. Plus, because Vermont runs an equal to slaughter program, which just became the first in the country, to my knowledge, that will allow state inspection for interstate sale. The agency was very concerned about how on-farm slaughter might affect their equal to status. So it hasn't affected their equal to status as of yet, um, but they're still very cautious about it. So it's, it's not, hey, let's let all the farmers do more and let the farmers do the slaughter and sell. It's, that's not how it works. It's about the person buying the animal and slaughtering the animal themselves or arranging for itinerant slaughter. The law actually says that the farmer cannot conduct the slaughter. Um, and so that, that you, you have to work within those kind of parameters for on-farm slaughter underneath the Federal Meat Inspection Act. And we, we your, your committee and the Senate committee did that in consultation with, with a, a high-ranking USDA uh, um, official. Uh, so we, it was not done lightly and it wasn't done without consultation with the USDA uh, and approval from the USDA. So I, I just want to put that out there and say that it has to work within those parameters. So just to be clear, um, a farmer can sell an animal on the hoof to another individual or individuals if they're going yes. to have or quarter. Yes. Those people have to engage an itinerant slaughterer to come to the farm to do the slaughter. Or do the slaughter themselves. Or do the slaughter themselves, right? And then they, they take the part and they um, either hire somebody to do the cut up or they do the cut up themselves. Yes, they can, they can, they can half or quarter the animal um, on, on the farm. Site. Yeah, and then take it someplace else for the, the, the rest of the cut up. Well, the, the laws is fairly silent on what happens after the, the slaughtered animal leaves the farm. Okay. Um, so is everybody clear on that? Yeah. Um, Vicki, your hand is up. Oh, thank you, Mike. That was helpful. That explanation. So my question is, with the backlog of people not being able to have animals slaughtered, is is really the big issue that we don't have enough itinerant slaughterers who can do this from farm to farm? And I remember a couple um, meetings ago, we talked about it and Bobby was saying mm -hmm. how we have this program at VTC and yet, no, we really don't. So it, is there a backlog because we're not uh, getting enough certified licensed slaughterers. I just wondered, Michael, do you know more about that or how do we talk about that issue? I, I think the backlog is in um, the capacity at slaughterhouses. Um, it's, it's uh, th there have been challenges that the slaughterhouses have faced over the years, whether it's getting a site um, permitted um, or functioning properly, uh, meeting the USDA requirements for, for slaughter, which are mm -hmm. specific under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, getting people to staff the slaughterhouse because it's not 
the easiest job. Um, and it's not a job you need some, some knowledge of how to do. Uh, so th that is probably where the backlog comes in the most, the, the, um, the difficulties in, in establishing a commercial slaughter facility. But that said, you, you're, you're leaps and bounds ahead of where you were like 10 years ago, 10 years ago, they were shutting down and there was real concern about where to go. Um, now there are places to go. It's just that the demand for their services are, are much higher because of the certain situation. Um, I don't know if that answered your question sufficiently, but. Thanks, Could Jake. there be um, more itinerant slaughters? Probably. Um, uh, I would add, I would add that you should ask the agency their interpretation or, or opinion of how itinerant slaughter is working. And I, I would say that um, it, as we 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 ship our our lambs to. Um, a USD inspected uh, facility, but our cattle are done here by an itinerant slaughterer who is really um, amazing, um, but he's older. And I would say, you know, this is a place where there could be more younger people coming in to learn the trade, um, um, but it's a tough one. I want to follow up, Michael. Didn't we, uh, when we did the, um, at some point when we did one of the iterations of on-farm slaughter, didn't we put caps on the number of animals that could be done? Yes. Uh, and that is purely a state, that was a state policy decision um, to, to partly address the concerns of the agency and partly address the committee's concerns about how it would work. Um, so uh, you put caps, you can change those caps. Those, those caps are not um, in any way federally based. Those are okay. state based. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Bartholomew and then Terry, your hands are up. And then Cynthia. I hope I didn't misunderstand after Mike's um, explanation, but if you use an itinerant salt slaughterer, you can't just sell that meat in the open market, right? That, that's correct. Yeah, yes, that's so, correct. So it's, I think that's part of the answer to um, what uh, Vicki was asking is um, just because there aren't enough itinerant slaughterers does not solve the problem. If I have a small farm and some of my people are buying the whole animal, I might be able to sell it using an itinerant slaughterer. But if I wanna be able to sell animals and have them inspected. It really comes down to inspected slaughterhouses that are, you know, the, the capacity there. Uh, yes, if you if you want to sell in commerce, yes. Now, right, a couple right. of years ago, you amended the on-farm slaughter law to clarify that that the animal could be owned by a, an individual or a number of individuals. So, so if you're creative, you could probably, you and your friends could go in on buying an animal um, yourselves, four of your friends or more, and then slaughter the animal yourselves or buy an itinerant slaughter and then, and then take the, the meat and divide it among the owners of the animal. So you're, you're basically moving the transaction up the up the supply chain, right? From from a grocery store purchase to actually you're getting your meat at the farm and slaughtering at the farm for a number of different individuals. It's it's not sale. At, that's still personal slaughter, um, but that there there's some flexibility there do you understand what i'm saying like if you were proactive and you really wanted to 
to get your meat at a very local source, you could use the on-farm slaughter law. You and your friends, your, your neighbors could do that to, to get your meat very locally uh, instead of having to buy it at the store. But, but I'm thinking more of the farmer who's trying to sell. And, and th we had some, this issue on our farm where, yes, we would have a certain number of people who might want to buy a whole animal and it would work fine. But if you've got 40 lambs to sell and you manage to sell 10 that way, you've got 30 animals you need to be able to sell in the open market. You can't right. use an itinerant slaughterer in that case. You've got to use right. an inspected facility. And right. I think that's where we're running into the problem is people who want to be able to sell their meat by whoever comes or at their farm stand or whatnot. They've got to have, they've got to have an inspected facility. Uh, yes, yes. All right, Terry's hand was up, but it's now down. Uh, Terry, was there something that you wanted to ask or was your question answered? Uh, I was just gonna say we, we can talk about the raising the numbers and such, but I remember two years ago, we took a lot of testimony when we originally talked about all this and it's not something we can do in this short little period of time to even come up with a solution, but I think one of the, the real problems is we don't have enough slaughterhouses in Vermont and there's lots of reasons for it. But one of the reasons is if you've ever been to a slaughterhouse, it is not a pleasant job. And it's just not something that somebody is going to say, well, you know, they got out of high school, I'm gonna own a slaughterhouse because it's very, it's a nasty job and it's not, something that any anybody would really want to do I don't think yeah thanks Terry um Cynthia is uh, it's your turn and then Rodney has his hand up as well go ahead Cynthia thank you and always bearing in mind that um although I'm familiar with this issue uh, over the years I'm new to the discussion but just looking at things from the perspective of an economist, the situation of people having a product that customers want, but they can't get it processed is just an economic tragedy. And that's what we heard the other day. But what strikes me is the possibility that this is something that the producers who have this issue they need to band together into some kind of cooperative and create the slaughterhouse capacity that they need. There might be a role for the state to facilitate that or to subsidize that, but the problem that I'm hearing, in order to solve it, the producers need to get together and create the capacity so they know that they will have the capacity and that the facility could be run according to the most humane, the most clean, the most inspected standards, and it would maintain their brand and the Vermont brand. Not something we're gonna do right now, obviously. <laughs> I just wanna put that out there. I think if the producers are waiting for the state to solve this problem, the state is not gonna be able to solve it. I think the producers need to form a cooperative and see if they could get somewhere that way. But again, just looking at it from my perspective. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, when we offered our recommendations to Apropos, um, one of the recommendations was that if uh, money could be located that uh, for working lands, that uh, money might be applied there for larger infrastructure projects such as slaughterhouses or um, uh, forest products infrastructure. So um, Rodney, you're next. And then John, is your hand up again or um, did you? Okay, great. Rodney, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, kind of add to Vicky's question about why it's such a shortage right now. Uh, two or three things happened at once. Once it was uh, 
you know, it's been people that have sold, you know, get their animal butchered and sell it on the market. Uh, and when COVID hit, a couple of big slaughterhouses had to shut down because they got COVID in their plant. And so that backlog, uh, 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 how you could get rid of, you know, if you just wanted to sell your animal on the commercial market, then all of a sudden that shut down, you couldn't get them there. Um, so some people were, you know, and then all of a sudden there was a push for local meat because it, it was hard to find in a grocery store. So then these people that had farmer markets or, or CSAs or whatever, all of a sudden they wanted to get more animals in because they had a bigger market. And, and then uh, one other thing that happened in our area is a guy bought a farm, brought in about a hundred beef animals from Kansas and bought the slaughterhouse that's in the region. So now his animals get preference um, for slaughter. And, you know, so it kind of backlogs us in this area into that. So, you know, that's what you got to compete with. Yeah. But Thanks I don't think me. that, it, you know, I don't think raising the number for on-farm slaughter is going to solve that problem. And I think once the milk meat gets back in the supermarkets and stuff, because it, you know, that I, I think that's going to ease up a little bit. Yeah. I think one of the other challenges for slaughterhouses is the fact that it's extremely seasonal. So, you know, especially in the fall, um, there are a lot of animals that are, are ready to, to go. So um, it creates a, a real, it, it's, it's not necessarily an even sort of product flow. So um, yeah, thanks Rodney. Uh, John's hand is up. If we have time, we have about five minutes. So after John, um, Michael, if you want to say a word about the um, uh, the compact or whatever it's called that allows for uh, state Vermont state inspected meat to be sold out of state, um, I think that would be interesting. So John, why don't you go ahead and then uh, maybe we hear from Michael if we have enough time. Well, I was just going to add two things, just to reemphasize what you just said, and I was going to say the. Um, <clears throat> Seasonality is not just a, ma a minor blip, it's huge. And, and I think that we aren't really that sh as short of slaughterhouse capacity as we might think, but the seasonality thing is so huge. And um, uh, Cynthia's point about creating a consortium of, of producers, you would still have the seasonality issue. And the other point I was gonna make is um, starting up a slaughterhouse business is, is extraordinarily expensive. And um, uh, Terry mentioned uh, finding workers. Well, you can't just find any worker. You, you're under a considerable scrutiny in an inspected facility. So not only do you have to find people willing to do the work, they've gotta be really trained and they've gotta be willing to follow all the rules or you're gonna get shut down. It's not an easy business to just jump into. It takes a, not only finding labor, but it's, it's really mm -hmm. expensive. Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. Um, Mike, do you want to just say a word or two about this new uh, development? Sure. So generally, under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, if you are going to ship your meat, sell it across interstate lines, it has to be inspected by USDA federal inspection. Um, there are state inspections, uh, state slaughter inspections, but when that occurs, the, the state inspected meat usually has to be sold within the state and can't be sold across state lines. However, uh, in August, USDA and the state uh, of Vermont, the Agency of Agriculture, uh, finalized an agreement to allow um, state inspected meat from certain facilities um, and processors to be shipped across state lines. And so that's kind of a first in the nation um, process. Uh, it, will, it will allow um, 
greater markets for the state inspected meat. Um, it could drive more demand to those state inspected establishments um, because they would then be able to push the meat across state lines. Um, you know, I'm looking at a press release and Senator Lee, he says something, the governor says something, but it, it, um, it would be, I think, for Vermont, the first, maybe not in the nation, probably on the East Coast, first on the East Coast to allow for that to happen. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, this is something that the State Agriculture and Rural Leaders uh, Group was working on for years and years. Um, I remember attending a conference up near Mount Washington where uh, we were working hard for this. So I'm really glad that this is something that's occurred. I think the, the original concept was to make it more of a Northeast uh, compact, but um, just this first step is I think a real plus. So thanks for that, Michael. Um, so John Bartholomew and Rodney, your hands are still up and I'm wondering if you have more questions or if you just forgot to lower your hands. They're down. All right, I think we need to wrap this up. Um, does anyone on the committee feel that they want to hear from um, Michael Snyder on Friday? Um, I'm seeing shaking of heads. No. Anybody nodding their heads? No? Okay. I, I always like to hear from Michael Snyder. <laughs> well, I do too. I just, I, I don't know that he has anything uh, to say. add to his last report, but um, um, so the question is, and Sharon's chatting with me and asking if we're meeting tomorrow. Uh, typically we would not have a committee meeting on Thursday. However, we're on the floor of the, with the budget. Um, and the, our, our typically our next meeting would be Friday from 8.30 to 10.30. And I'm wondering if there's anything that we need to meet for um, Michael, um, do you feel that it's going to be necessary for us to officially meet to approve the language that you're uh, working on? Um, well, I can send that out to you today and you can then make that decision. Um, I, I don't think the changes are significant and I will highlight where the changes are made. And then I guess it's up to you. Yeah, and we did have a a thumbs up uh, exercise earlier when we talked about this. So uh, pot potentially we don't need to meet on Friday, which uh, means that you can all sleep in. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Not that any of you do. Um, so anybody feel that we need on we need to meet on Friday? I'm I'm not seeing anybody. Yeah, uh, John. O'Brien, have you heard anything about the tree warden bill? <clears throat> I I have not. Um, I know that was a priority. Um, uh, and last I knew it was in natural resources. So um, I have not had any update on that. Um, Michael Grady, do you have any ideas about that? No, I haven't, I haven't heard anything about it. I can, I can email Tucker and get an update if, if you would like. Okay, that would be good. Um, In yeah. Senate, Senate Natural Resources. Yes, yeah. So we'll, we'll find out, I'll, I'll do a little scouting around and Michael will ask Tucker and um, we'll, we'll get a word on that. Is that the only really outstanding bill <clears throat> that's come through our committee that we uh, might it was, have to way back was, in on? It was the only one that made the list of priorities for the speaker. There, we had the humane officer definition. I think there was another one, but- um, um, We had agritourism agri bill that ag passed the house. Agritourism was down, is down in um, Senate Judiciary. Uh, last I knew, I don't know that um, anything has happened with that. So, um, so the tree warden bill is the one that we worked on that made the list, um, the, the speaker's list of priorities. So, uh, but I'll, I'll scout around and see what's going on with that. And Michael will too. 
John Bartholomew, your hand is up. Yes. Do you know whatever happened with that tax department thing with the identifying lands out of current use? That whole thing with the. Yeah, um, last time I touched base with Ann coming, um, um, I, I thought everybody was pretty much on board with it, but they I don't know that they got it across the line. I don't know, Michael, if you know anything about that. I don't know about that one either. Yeah, I don't think that was one of your bills anyway. No. It was um, such a simple thing that the tax department agreed with. So it's unfortunate I know. it didn't. I know, they actually came up with the language. Yeah, right. um, yeah. Was, uh, was Abby the drafter of that? Um, was this hmm? for solar arrays or for the-, the No, this cottages? was a, this is the cottages thing, cottages, land out yeah. of current use. Yeah. If yeah. You... Yep. yeah. Doug Farnham was in total agreement with that. They worked together. We came up with perfect language. Um, and I'm trying to think of who drafted that. Um, Just look up in the board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We should have taken a picture of the board. I should have before we left. <laughs> That's what we should have done. Um, all right, so that one is still hanging out there. Uh, that was in Senate Finance last I knew. Cynthia, your hand is up. I was just wondering if you have those tax provisions in a separate bill. I can't remember the status of the miscellaneous tax bill, which might be 954. If it's still moving, that might be an opportunity. I, I don't know. I just don't remember if it's passed already or not. Um, but definitely you need to check on the status. But if that bill is moving, that might be a place to put a provision that everybody supported. Okay. Yeah, that went through um, Ways and Means um, and ended up over in Senate Finance. So. So that's a good idea, Cynthia. Thanks so much. It was that H-954 you said? My recollection is that miscellaneous tax was H-954. I just don't remember whether it's already gone all the way through or what. Um, so we should check on that. Okay. All right. Good enough. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, any other thoughts right now? Do we need to meet on Friday? All right, I'm not hearing anybody clamoring for a meeting on Friday. So why don't we say that we will not meet on Friday and our next official meeting will be next Wednesday. All right. All right, I wanna thank everybody um, for all of your help and your input. Thank you, Michael, as always, couldn't do it without you. Welcome. And um, same with Steve and the A Agency of Ag folks that were with us today. And of course, Linda Lehman, our assistant. So uh, Linda, why don't you take us off live and um, we wish you all a really great weekend. And well, it's only Wednesday, so <laughs> see you tomorrow for the budget. <laughs>